Good afternoon, Tara. Hi, Ben. What can I do for you? Well, I need a whole bunch of pottery. Pottery? Great. What kind of pottery do you need? Well, I'm going to need enough pottery to store all of my dried produce for the entire winter. Okay, so it sounds like what you really need then is pots. Okay, well, what's the difference? Well, um, if you look over here, you can see all the different kinds of pottery that I make. It could be teapots, plates, mugs, bowls, even a duck. But a pot is something very specific. A pot is specifically what I'm using to store food, like this. So I'm going to need a lot of these pots, but if you have to make these many pots for everybody in town, that seems like a really big responsibility. Well, it is a big responsibility. In fact, it's not unusual for the potters here in Salem to be making around three or four thousand of these pots a year. Oh. And that especially goes up a lot during the Revolutionary War. Really? Why is it so much more during the war? Well, you remember how before the war, everyone was able to get really cheap pottery from factories in England? Once the war started and we went to war with England, it was really hard to get that cheap pottery anymore. So people had to find it somewhere else. And at that time, we were the biggest pottery in the area. So people from as much as 60 miles away started coming here to buy their pottery. In fact, we even have an occasion in the records that describes what it was like when everyone came to Salem to buy pottery. May 18th. This was a day the like of which had never yet been seen in Salem. Such a crowd had gathered that the street from the tavern to the blacksmith shop was so full of people and horses that it was difficult to pass through. The potter shop was kept closed and the persons who had ordered pottery had paid for it in butter and had received tickets were served through the window. Colonel Armstrong did good service, threatening the people with his drawn sword if they did not keep quiet, and for a wonder, they were still, for there were not as many pieces of pottery in the shop as there were people outside, and they realized that it could not be helped so many of them got nothing. Wow, that sounds really stressful. I think about all the pots I need from my family alone, and it's probably a hundred pots. I bet that's probably true. What's the storage space like at your house? Well, if you've got enough time, let's go over there and take a look. Okay. All right, let's, let's go. go. Thank you so much for coming over, Tara. Yeah. So this is our house, and though it may seem a little bit small, it's actually a really typical size of an early family home here in Salem. So our little house consists really of just the stove room, mm -hmm. and the stove room is both our living room and it's our bedroom as well. And then we have the kitchen over here. So this is kind of the main floor, but upstairs we have an attic, and up in the attic is where I store most of my food. So things like dried grain, um, maybe fermented cabbage, pickles, dried apples, things like that. And so that's really where I want to store a whole bunch of the food. But then down in the cellar, that's roughly about the same size as what the attic is. So you have twice the food storage space that you do living space. Exactly. That's a lot of pots. Yeah, it really is a lot of pots. And I'm thinking that we can probably do about five pots this way, mm -hmm. 10 deep, which gives me 50 pots upstairs. Okay. And then down in the cellar being the same size, I think it'd be about the same, about 50. So you're looking at around 100 storage pots then? I think I'll need 100 pots. Okay, so I'll get down around 100 pots for your family. Are all the houses in town about this size? Well, no, like I say, ours is a little bit smaller. And then you have somebody like Dr. Veerling, mm -hmm. who has a large family, almost eight people. Oh, wow. And they're wealthy as well, so they have a huge house compared to this one. So that's going to take quite a few more. Okay, so we're looking at a lot of the families in town having maybe a hundred storage pots or even more in their houses. Yeah, the, and it seems really daunting to me to think about you making all those pots. And I can't imagine how many pots you'd have to make a day to right. build enough pots just for the people in town, much less for a 60 mile radius around here. That's true. And it is a lot of work, but there are slower ways of making pottery and there are faster ways of making pottery. Now, fortunately, the potters here in Salem have some techniques that they can use to help them make pots very quickly. And that'll help us provide for all of the people here in town. I'll show you. What I've got right here is the beginning of a coil pot. You start out with long strips or coils. They can be rolled out flat or rolled into kind of like a snake. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to scrape up the edges here of my coil. And this is called scoring. This is going to kind of 
open up the grain of the clay so that it has something to grip onto. It's sort of like making Velcro. And then I'm gonna also score the edges of my pot where I want to add this coil. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this soupy clay called Slip. And this is going to act as a glue. So I'm just gonna kind of paint that onto the edge and then wrap my coil around the top of the pot here. And at this point, it's just a matter of kind of pinching and squeezing the clay and smoothing out that seam there. Now, if you do this right, you can get really large pottery this way. And you can also get pottery that's very smooth and you get a lot of control over what kind of shapes you get. But the downside of this is the speed. So this is something that a lot of the enslaved potters around here or a lot of the Native Americans are using to make pottery for themselves but they're not really using techniques like this to make thousands of pots like the Salem potters are. For that, we're gonna need speed. And so we're gonna have a different technique that allows us to do things just like this, but a little bit faster. When the wheel is turning like this with my foot, my hands are free to actually shape the clay. And so that allows me to shape it pretty smoothly all the way around. Just like with the coil pot, I'm still just pinching and smoothing the clay but this time the wheel is turning it through my fingers. And because of that, you can see that whatever I do on one side happens all of the way around. And that allows me to shape it really quickly. With techniques like this, I can really make my pottery a lot faster. And that's what enables the Salem potters to be able to make the pottery that they're making in the quantities that they're making. And that really does sound like factory work to me. It is. And you know, we're not the only ones making pottery in this large of numbers. So who else would be making pottery like this? Well, let's go see. Just look at this huge pot. I know this thing is massive. Like, I bet that you could climb inside of that pot. I probably could. We're at Mesda, and this pot was made by an enslaved potter by the name of David Drake from Edgefield, South Carolina. Now this pot is a pretty great example of a lot of the types of pottery going on in America that were in more of a factory setting. David Drake was making hundreds of pots like this at a time, and a lot of them were large, impressive pots, just like this one here. So he's making a pot this big on a potter's wheel? That's exactly right. That's amazing. So can you make a pot this big on the potter's wheel? Not really. That's part of what makes his work so impressive. Most of the other potters at this time period that are making pots this large were based out of Asia. How much grain do you think I could put into this pot? This pot holds around 30 gallons of grain, which isn't even David Drake's largest pot. Wow, I don't know that I could even lift this pot without any grain in it, much less carry it down into the cellar with 30 gallons of grain in this thing. <laughs> That's probably true. And it really does give us an appreciation for the amount of work that went into making pottery like this and the potters who were making it. So next time that you open up a can of beans, take a minute and think about how many storage pots you'd need for your house. And think about the potters who would have made those pots. Potters like the ones here in Salem and like David Drake. 